Hi, everybody. I'm back with another report uh, on this COVID-19 pandemic. I've been asked to give a report a little earlier than usual. So here's your update. I'll start sharing my screen with all of you. All right, so just a broad overview. Thankfully, the peak has occurred already globally, but hotspots do remain. Cases and hospitalizations are decreasing in the US and in California. Uh, vaccination, unfortunately, is also down and mortality is still rising as there is always that lag after the cases and the hospitalizations. So to start telling you about the variants, of course, it's still all about Omicron, over 99.9% .9 of cases. It has really outperformed every other variant right now. You can see in this geographic region that really the Delta only remains a tiny sliver that you can barely make out on all of these pie charts around the country. And specifically here in Santa Clara, the Omicron cases have elevated, but interestingly, uh, still overall cumulative numbers um, far outweighed by Delta than Omicron. When we think about Omicron BA.2 and what we should know about the subvariants, uh, we know a little bit more now from studies in Denmark, where it is uh, the majority of the Omicron variant present, and we're seeing an increase in cases in Denmark. Uh, and when they look at transmission in Danish households, you can see that uh, the conclusion is that it's substantially more transmissible than BA.1, uh, and that it may reduce the protective effect of vaccination but it does not increase its transmissibility from vaccinated individuals with breakthrough infections, which is good news overall. This is an interesting finding uh, published in Cell, looking at T-cell reactivity to the Omicron variant, which shows that it is preserved in most, but not all individuals. So you can see that looking at just the wild type, meaning the ancestral strain of COVID, the Delta version, and then the Omicron version, you can see that 21% of individuals will have a decreased response to the Omicron spike uh, in comparison between those, those groups. But after a booster dose of the vaccination, you can see there's actually a 20 times increase in T cell pre reactivity. And that means that about 9% of boosted individuals will still have a decreased response to the Omicron spike. So really less than 10% of people uh, left without a good uh, response. So that's not so bad. And when we look at another uh, preprint showing the same sort of uh, finding, when you look at elderly populations and you look all the way down at the bottom of this chart at the Omicron uh, line, you can see that after the second vaccination, really almost zero response to the Omicron virus in the elderly population. But after the boost, the booster dose of vaccination, then they are able to retain good uh, sort of immune response against the Omicron virus. So even four months after vaccination. So that's great news. So having said all that, let's get into vaccination rates. You can see that unfortunately the US is still kind of at the bottom of the first world wealthy nations around the uh, globe. You can see that we do have over 210 million people fully vaccinated with close to 68% over the age of five and up at 88% over the age of 65. But unfortunately, when you look at the number of people that are eligible to get a booster dose um, of those people, only 41.8% have received it. So definitely an opportunity to spread the word that the booster is really important, specifically against the Omicron variant. When you look at the number of doses administered per day, you can really see that it follows these um, peaks and valleys of surges, where when there is a surge, people are a little bit more afraid of getting the, the uh, infection and therefore go get vaccinated. But now that we're down at the end of a surge or coming down off of a surge, vaccination is also coming down. When you look at by state, uh, you can see Wyoming and Alabama are still holdouts. Uh, not a very good percent of their residents fully vaccinated, but uh, a scattering of vaccination rates all across the rest of the country and the Northeast really leading the way in vaccination rates, specifically with a significant increase over the last two weeks in New York. When you look at California, there was a sort of lag in reporting, uh, but then again, now that reporting has picked up again, you can see that we mirror that decrease in overall daily vaccination. When you look at vaccination status by group, by age, 
again, as usual, California is doing a little bit better than the rest of the country as far as our complete total population. But when you look at the elderly population over age 65, not doing as well, only around 83% compared to 88% nationwide. So another opportunity to communicate to the elderly population here how important vaccination and booster is. When you look at Santa Clara County in particular, we're actually doing really well. We have over 93% uh, of our age over 18 population vaccinated, even age five to 17, 69% of that population is vaccinated. And when you look at the percent of eligible residents for a booster, almost 65% have gotten that booster, which is great. And then in the elderly population, as compared to the rest of the state, we are doing really well at 95% vaccination. So when we look at cases globally, you can see Russia has had a rapid increase, uh, perhaps just in reporting or true cases. Europe decreased and then increased again over the last two weeks. And certain areas are just holding out as hot like the US, for example. When you compare us to the EU, interestingly, looking at these lines, you can see the EU came down off of a peak, but then had a second jump up and now appear to be coming down off of that one as well, whereas the US kind of had this jagged rise and now falling nicely. We'll see if that continues to trend in that direction. And when you look at selected countries with rising case rates compared with the US, again, of course, Denmark really stands out to us as how many cases they have and that exponential sort of rise, some people are theorizing is due to that BA.2 variant being uh, the majority of their cases. However, when you look at places like India, for example, who also are reporting a majority of BA.2, you can see they had a slow rise, but now actually sloping downwards again already. So it's difficult to know why BA.2 is behaving differently in different nations around the globe, but we'll continue to track and trend that. As of right now, at least, the US is trending down nicely, as is the UK, but certain other countries are actually still trending up, such as Russia and Brazil. So looking at cases nationally, you can see this really nice downward trend off of the peak over the last two weeks. And when you look at the map, you can see, although we're still hot in many areas of the country, this really nice uh, clearing in that Northeast region where the vaccination rate is so high. When you look at California cases, you can see also we are decreasing sharply down off of our peak, which is great to see. Same with Santa Clara County cases and same with San Mateo County cases. When you look at Stanford cases, you can see we also have this nice slope downward. We had our highest number of cases in that first week of January, and then a sort of slow downward trend since then. And when you look at the cumulative positive tests, you can see the majority of those really did occur just within the last month. The same holds true for our Stanford faculty, postdocs, and staff, where again, you can see that in that first week of January, we had the majority of our cases, and then that's a nice downward sloping trend since then. Uh, in that group as well. When you look at SARS-CoV-2 in the pediatric population, last time I presented this, I told you guys about this incre an interesting increase in type 1 diabetes in the pediatric population since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and now I'll just show you this other interesting data about MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And you can see that vaccination appears to have reduced the likelihood of MISC by 91%. And in adolescents hospitalized with MISC, 95% of those individuals were not vaccinated, and no vaccinated MISC patients required life support. So really interesting and good data to share uh, with your family and friends with children. When you look overall at the statistics, we are still kind of at a high point as far as the uh, proportion of the overall population that is a pediatric population making up COVID cases. So 22.8% uh, represented by children right now. Uh, you can see that the hospitalization rate and mortality rate, thankfully, are still quite low. When you look at overall hospitalizations, there's been this really nice decrease in that lately as well. In the US, as well as in California, you can see that there's a good decrease off of the peak there. In Santa Clara, uh, you can see there's a little bit of a decrease off the peak, maybe more of a plateau to a decrease. Hopefully that will continue to trend downward soon. And the same holds true for San Mateo, where there is a sort of plateau to slow decrease in these last few days. In San Francisco, there is a nice decrease down off of the peak, 
which was 286 hospitalizations, and now we're down at 245. So that's a good trend to see. When you look at overall mortality nationally, you can see that there's still this steep upward rise in mortality. Uh, as a reminder, that total number of deaths uh, last week surpassed the total population of the city of San Francisco. So a sobering number when you think about it in those terms. When you look at uh, the US compared to all the other um, high income nations around the world, you can really see that stark contrast where you see that we are at the very top of cumulative deaths per capita throughout the pandemic, cumul cumulative deaths per capita during the Omicron wave, and then contrasting that with the share of the population fully vaccinated and the share of the population with a booster dose, you can really see how that has affected that trend. When you look at mortality here in California, you can see, unfortunately, we are still in that continued rise. And in Santa Clara County, also a little bit of an increase in the last two weeks of 36 deaths over the last week compared to um, just 17 to 14 over the weeks prior. And finally, I'll end by just sharing some interesting information with the uh, references below. If you want to look at this more on your own, you can see that there's this really nice review out in nature, just showing the entire uh, immune system and its response to COVID-19 infection, how we respond to it, and what really happens when things go wrong, when we have an over response or sort of systemic inflammation leading to multi-organ failure, and in some cases, unfortunately, death, and how the immune response plays a role in that uh, cycle. Also really interesting news lately that has come out, which is near and dear to my heart because of my interest in smell and uh, research in smell loss and dysfunction, is this uh, demonstration of autonomous disruption of nuclear architecture as a cause of COVID-19 induced anosmia. And the researchers really uh, did a nice job showing that uh, as the virus uh, infects the surrounding cells, that even within the neurons themselves, this nuclear architecture is disrupted and certain proteins that we need for cell regulation, production of odor receptor proteins is downregulated in the long term. And so that may really uh, show us a good reason why we have this uh, long-term smell loss in some patients after COVID-19 and may also uh, give it good mechanism for why we are seeing these problems in many organs throughout our body in the long term for some patients after COVID-19 infection. And so with that, I will stop sharing. And I hope that that was interesting information for all of you. I hope it helps you make decisions in the coming weeks. And I will see you again soon.